wasn't able to join live. Okay, good evening. Welcome everybody to this week's special edition of Virtual Mentor Office Hours brought to you this week by not only ourselves, Global Lawyers of Canada, but also the Graduate Law Students Society of UBC. Um, and today we have the president of GLSS, Ryan Peterson, with us today. And he's going to give you a little spiel about GLSS at the end, just in case you don't know who they are. Um, but tonight we are talking about LLMs. Specifically, we're talking about the UBC LLM program because tonight our panel is made up of four UBC LLM alumni. So they are going to be answering some of your questions that you guys have sent in ahead of time. And then they are also going to answer some of your questions live tonight. So if you do have any questions, please do drop them in the chat box down below. You can send them to me privately or you can make them public so everyone can see the questions. Um, and we will try and get to as many of your questions as possible because I know you've probably got lots and lots and lots. So I'm going to try and do as little talking as possible tonight, which is really hard. So I want you guys to cut me off. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. So they're going to take a couple of minutes, tell you about their journey to the Canadian bar, um, and then we're going to get into a couple of questions. So Mitchell, would you go first, please? Sure, my pleasure. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Mitchell Fogel. I am currently a criminal defense lawyer in Vancouver. I went to the University of Dalhousie for my undergrad, and I did a double major in psychology and philosophy. And then after that, I took a, a couple of years off and was working in an unrelated field. So I decided to pursue law school. I had written the LSATs and I had tried to get into Canadian law school, but uh, I won't lie to you, I didn't have such great success. So rather than wanting to spend another year to wait to write the LSAT a third time, I decided to apply to some of the schools in the United Kingdom and had much better success there. So I enrolled in the two-year graduate law program at the University of Sussex and graduated from that in 2016. And then after that, I was fortunate to be accepted into the LLMCL program at UBC. So I decided to, to move to Vancouver so that I can do that. And afterwards, I uh, through some contacts that I had made when I was at UBC, actually, I wound up getting connected to a criminal defense uh, firm down here in Vancouver and was fortunate to find articles with them and then at the end of my articles, one of the partners from that firm uh, decided to leave and team up with another lawyer from a different firm and they were starting their own. So they approached me to ask if I wanted to be the first junior associate for, for their firm. So that's how I wound up working at uh, the firm that I'm at now. It's called Ferguson Allingham. And since then we've hired on an additional lawyer and every year we have a article student, a full-time article student and a summer student as well with us. So it is our hope that we can continue to grow our firm. We've got lots of great office space uh, downtown closer to uh, the West Pender, the, the, the downtown east side. And um, in a nutshell, that is me. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. And Ahmed, do you want to go next? Well, hi, everyone, and thank you very much for having me today. Uh, it's my first time talking to the international trained lawyers, and it's such a pleasure to talk to all of you. So about myself, I got my first uh, degree, like it was a law degree from Egypt in 2010, and then I uh, got a master's in public policy and public administration from England in 2015. And then I moved to Canada and I decided to, that I want to practice law. I didn't practice law in Egypt, unfortunately. So I worked in politics and journalism. I wanted to take this as my career path. But then when I moved to Canada, I was like, oh, well, what can I do with the degree I have? And then I decided to, that like a law degree, like I would, be, I would use it and be um, like practice law here. So I decided to do the LLM at UBC. I started in 2017. Uh, it took me a bit longer because I took a leave of absence for, for a year in the middle. I went to the U.S. I got the Fulbright Fellowship. I studied law at the Arizona State University for, uh, for some time and then I worked in a lobbying firm. Uh, right now I'm articling in a construction litigation uh, law firm in West Vancouver. I'm towards the end of my articles. Uh, currently I'm doing the PLTC. Um, hopefully I will pass the PLTC and be called to the bar by uh, the end of December. 
That's fantastic. And Ahmed, are you doing PLTC online? Yes, and it is very challenging online. Okay, I'm sure we'll talk about that later on because that's um, that's interesting and different to I think what most of us here experience. Uh, Harpreet, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. It's so good to always uh, see some familiar faces. Um, and for those of you guys who don't know, Ahmed and I went to, uh, we did our LLM together. So it'll be interesting to hear about his experiences versus mine. <laughs> um, so just a bit about me. I did my bachelor's in criminology and poli sci. I always wanted to go to law school. I used to like fight my parents on my dinner, the boys I could date, like you name it, everyone knew I wanted to get into law. Um, I wrote the LSAT. It was the worst time of my life. I hated it so much and I was waitlisted for two years and uh, I decided that uh, it was probably best for me to kind of explore other avenues and so I ended up um, studying at the University of London and um, sorry City University of London in London central London I was great in hindsight the best experience of my life um, you know forty dollars doesn't even get you a full gas tank here but there I was flying to Portugal which was awesome um, and so after that I decided to do my LLM and it was great to get the perspective of you know uh, going to school here and also interacting with other JD students um, I particularly had a really good time expanding my network um, meeting all of you guys and uh, right now I am articling I'm at a criminal uh, defense firm in uh, downtown Vancouver it's absolutely nuts and uh, I have the best stories so I'm like one of the those people that you want at a party because like I just think that we have got fantastic clients but um, I start PLTC in uh, February so I'm looking forward to uh, that vacation which will not be a vacation but I'm sure a change of pace from what I'm doing now um, and um, yeah I'm, I'm really happy to answer everyone's questions I've had a bunch of people reach out to me on LinkedIn I'm also working um, with the Global Lawyers of Canada. I'm on their board as well. So really looking forward to um, meeting everyone and you know answering whatever questions I can. Thanks, Hart. I can't wait to hear some of those stories. Next time we can all get together over a drink and we can actually like share a few more of those stories, probably when we're not recording the session as well. We'll <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's fantastic. Uh, Charlotte, uh, last recruit, last minute. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlotte Chamberlain. Um, I was asked to jump on here about 20 minutes ago, and I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I'm often giving little bits and bobs of advice to individual people, so it's really great, like great use of time to, do, to give, I don't know, 30 people advice and my thoughts on the LLM at the same time. Um, and I love doing it, so please feel free to reach out to me uh, if anything um, comes of this session, you'd like to chat any more. So um, I'm a lawyer based in Vancouver and I practice um, civil litigation. Um, I'm, in, I'm practicing in quite a unique um, environment at the moment as I'm a sorry, counsel with the um, Cullen Commission of Inquiry into money laundering in British Columbia. So it's a government inquiry um, into money laundering. So it's fixed term. I'll be doing that until next year. Um, I went to, um, so that's broadly administrative and regulatory litigation type work. Um, I went to law school at the University of Bristol in England. Um, as you can probably tell I'm from England, so I don't have an undergrad. Um, um, and then I originally came to Canada just to travel and I got completely blown away. So after a year of spending time and working with some organizations in Quebec, I um, did the LLM at UBC in 2017. Um, I was sort of learning as I went along, um, didn't know much about the NCA process, so it took me a while to figure it out. So after graduating, I started applying for articling positions and I was a litigation paralegal in a boutique firm in Vancouver for a year um, before articling at Baskin, which is a big firm in downtown Vancouver and then um, after that I started my current position at the commission. 
I also want to hear how Brute's stories. I'm intrigued. I think we all do. I feel like everyone's heads were like, what stories? I want all the gossip, Harp. <laughs> I, I want to sure. hear those stories too. Mitchell, I'm sure you know, doing criminal defense, it's just absolutely, uh, we, we, I think we get the best, the best clients. We always say you, you can't make it up. <laughs> My I, stories are in the news every day at the moment. If you, if you Google Cullen Commission, everything that I've been, all the crazy stuff that I've been looking at for the last three months is now coming out every day in the news. So you guys can all share what, I'm, what I see. <laughs> I have zero exciting stories to tell you. Sorry. Like, <laughs> there's nothing in securities law <laughs> that's really like, super juicy so uh, you know that's the differences of different practice areas right which um, you guys are going to get to hear about tonight um so let's get straight into question time because i know that's why everybody is here tonight um so faraz has picked out a few questions ahead of time and um, unfortunately he couldn't be here tonight because it's uh, four o'clock in the morning in saudi arabia right now so he is probably tucked up in bed or at least on mute and not got his camera turned on in the background here um, so he's asked me to ask these four questions ahead of time, which you guys submitted. So we're going to kick it off with Ahmed first. Ahmed, do you think the LLMCL was worth it? And a follow on question for that is how has it helped you in your career as an ITL so far? Well, for me, it was a different experience because I didn't uh, come from a common law background. So, like, I did civil law. So, for me, I think it was worth it to just, like, get introduced to the common law principles and how it works here in, in, in Canada. So, I think it, it was worth it and it definitely helped me. So, uh, I had the option to do the NCAs, but then I decided to go with, an, with the LLM. It was very expensive and challenging at times, like, lots of work. But uh, harps can relate. Yeah, we used to study together for like long nights and stuff. But then it, it's, it's just like you get to learn like for someone from a civil law background, then it, it, it's very useful. And, and I would say it helped me a lot. The things that it's, it's, it's totally different from practice. So like what I'm practicing right now, it's like nothing that I learned in school, just like totally different. So it, I would say it, it was a bit theoretical theoretical things that I learned, but uh, yeah, I would say it was helpful overall and it was worth it. Excellent. And were you able to meet all of your NCA requirements through the LLM or did yeah. you have to take some of the NCA exams as well? No, I met all of the requirements. So as I said, I got my evaluation in 2017. Uh, I was required to do business organizations, but then the change does in 2018, so I didn't do it, and I ended up doing it, so when I met the requirements still, so I was a bit lucky, because like, the way of the course for me have way through, so. Fantastic, and for the rest of our panelists, did you think it was worth doing? And did you, did you choose the LLM specifically so you didn't have to do the challenge exams, or were there other factors that made you pick the LLM over just doing the NCA exams? And feel free, whoever would like to go first. Well, for me, um, it was a little bit of a mix. Um, I firstly liked the idea of not self-studying all of them, some, especially some of the more challenging ones. But having never lived in Vancouver and actually have never having never been to Vancouver before moving here, I thought it was a really good way to sort of instill myself in the legal community a little bit and 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 sort and get to grasp with the community more gradually rather than um, putting too much pressure on myself to to navigate it all alone. Um, and Ahmed, I think just said that he did them. Did you say you did them all as part of your LLM? Um, I think that's what he said, and that was I think Siobhan's question. I I didn't out of choice, even though I didn't have that many. I kept my ethics to, to challenge outside of the LLM so that I could keep more of my LLM modules to um, get some experience in areas that um, I wanted to practice. Um, if I'd done all of my exams through my LLM that I needed to do for the NCAs, I wouldn't have had much room for that. And I think that really helped me um, market myself as an articling student, having had some of those Canadian um, courses um, and being in classes with the JD students and have on my transcript um, 
grades that were comparable with other JD students um, and knowing those professors that could give me references, I think it made my application look a little bit more similar and more easily comparable with some of the JD students that were also applying for articles. And if it's, if it's feasible with how many um, of the exams you have um, um, to do, I would highly, highly recommend it. Um, it was really good when I when I, because it, especially because I went to law school in England and as I've mentioned it's the, it's an undergrad there and um, when I started out in law school I was 19 20 um, so I didn't necessarily do all the classes that I ended up being interested in um, so yeah it was definitely one of the most invaluable years not because of my NCA exams but more because of the other other courses I took that have been really instrumental in my practice now. Okay, um, Mitchell, do you have anything else to add from your view? Yes, I think that uh, I echo what, what a lot of the other speakers have already said. For me, I think it's about kind of knowing the way that uh, you study and the way that you are. So I have never really been somebody who is great on my own. I really thrive in like a group setting and not knowing anyone in Vancouver as well. I thought that it was going to be a great opportunity to network and to get involved. So. Uh, when I was at the University of Sussex, I was the president of the Canadian Law School Society, and I really enjoyed having that type of extracurricular academia as well. So uh, when I came to UBC, I had the opportunity to kind of get involved as well. So I was a representative for the Career Services uh, Center, and I was the vice president or the co-president of the uh, Graduate Law School Society as well. So I think that was a really great way to network and, and to meet some new people. And because of those connections, I think that I had uh, a much easier time uh, with uh, interviews and exposing myself to people who might be able to assist me to get those. Whereas otherwise, uh, like Charlotte said, if I was just here on my own in Vancouver, I think that that would have been possible but probably a, a lot more difficult so overall i think that it was a, a great experience and there's lots of great professors and and lots of help and so when you're transitioning it's uh, it could be quite daunting and as a result you know i didn't have to worry about missing an exam or getting to the very end of the road after all of these years and having someone say oh well you never took this uh, one particular ethics class so you got to go and start all over again and so it was nice to have a little bit of, of assistance as well in that regard. Excellent. And Hark, feel free to add in comments as well, but I'm going to jump into the next question as well for you. Um, considering the effects of COVID-19 right now, has, ha has have you seen that having an effect on the profession in general? And what would be your best advice for law students entering the profession at this time and particularly looking for articling positions? Right. Um, I'm just going to touch on the LLM question. Um, I loved the LLM so much that I ended up doing an extra uh, three months of a directed research study. So for me, it was just a fantastic experience, whether it was building community, getting career advice. Um, but at that same time, I have had a bunch of people reach out to me being like, do I need to do the LLM? No, it's just a, a different path. It's going to get you towards your end goal. And, um, you know, if you like school, um, sure. And if you've got uh, all the money that they ask you for, that that's great but it isn't um, a necessity um, but I mean it, it, it was really good um, I made a lot of lifelong friendships um, and uh, I, I, I would definitely recommend it because of all the support that you get and uh, with regards to um, COVID-19 in the profession definitely I, I've seen um, and heard from people firsthand um, how much it's affected their practice and whatnot um, and my advice to people who have reached out to me or to um, any one of you guys is that I think it's so important that like this is a time now where you should be networking, um, sending those emails. I know that sometimes it's just so heart wrenching. I think I sent like almost like, you know, two, 300 emails before I ended up getting my articles. 
but um, you need to put yourself out there and, and be confident and, and sell yourself. But I think another important um, thing too that I want to share with you guys is that if you don't get Art of Clean right now, it's okay. There are other paths, whether it's working as like a legal assistant or like doing some consulting or just working somewhere else. Um, because once you start working, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, like this never ends. Um, and I know a bunch of everyone's smiling now because of all the hours they're putting in, especially <laughs> um, Sean, probably you're up at like the crack of dawn and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're not sleeping like me. Um, but yeah, just, just be easy on yourself. I find that everyone is just so hard on themselves right now in terms of not um, getting articles. And I think they take it personally, but it's not. We are living through a global pandemic right now and there has been so many cutbacks. Um, and I've actually had a bunch of friends who um, have had their article, uh, you know, kind of revoked or even um, their associate positions because of the pandemic. Um, but it just goes to the point that you need to really put yourself out there. Don't be afraid of reaching out to people. I've had a bunch of people reach out on LinkedIn and stuff. And this is a time where you've got to expand your community and, and not be hard on yourself. And um, in the end, everything is going to be okay um, and you will get there. It's just going to take a little bit of time. So have faith. Yeah, so important. Be kind to yourself right now on that one. Uh, that leads us into the next um, good question. Um, Charlotte, what are the greatest hurdles in the path of ITLs looking to become qualified in Canada? Now, this can be pre-COVID, during COVID, whatever. I think those connections, um, is particularly for people that haven't um, got any legal experience in the city or the province where they want to practice, um, law students tend to start in Canada, tend to start making those connections quite early. Um, and those connections translate into, into experience, whether that's internships or, um, or summer studentships. Um, and I, and just that support network. Um, so I think that um, one of the things that I mentioned that was really advantageous of the LLM was making, uh, taking those courses. But actually most of the courses that I took were with adjunct professors that were practicing in those areas. And I'm pretty sure without exception, all of those people that I made connections with through the LLM would have been equally willing to talk to me had I just emailed them as a non-student and and, sa and said the reasons that I was interested interested in those areas and my aspirations for practicing and I'm sure and I'm sure they would have been interested um, to to touch base and to give me the same advice that they gave me during the LLM. So I think whether you're currently doing the LLM, planning to do the LLM, or not planning to do the LLM at all. You could be looking at the sort of people that practice in your areas now, reaching out, making those connections like Harp said. Um, and just on that point, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but on that point, one of the biggest challenges with that at, at the moment with COVID that I find is that conversation doesn't necessarily flow as easily um, when you've got a virtual meeting with someone as compared to when you're meeting them for coffee because things flow more naturally. So while it's not in my nature, what I found really useful to do is to have a list of questions in front of me that if things start to grow a bit stale, you have a question. Um, because otherwise things sort of wrap up qu quicker than you might like, I find, and then you think perhaps you didn't get the most out of that call. So don't leave it to chance, but just have a list of the things you want to talk about with that person um, so you get the most out of it. Um, but other challenges that uh, ITLs face, there's definitely some extent of discrimination, um, for sure. Um, like firms have either a conscious or a subconscious quota, like maximum amount of ITLs that they can have in the firm. Um, and like, there, like there's something to do with quality there, which there's clearly not. Um, and also, um, um, there's some perception that um, that because you have your law degree somewhere else, you don't know Canadian law. Um, I've had people say it to me in a roundabout way a few times. Um, and that's one of the challenges that doing the LLM definitely does help to overcome. 
Um, but if you don't do the LLM, perhaps go to conferences or go and do courses. I did an online University of Alberta course um, on indigenous legal systems, um, which was really useful. And just having, having something to counter those preconceptions with is really useful. Um, and, but yeah, other than that, we have the same, we have the same problems that, that, that you would have anywhere else, but it's just that people tend to have a, a step, um, a foot in the door before us um, because we just arrived or we're just coming back. So it's natural that that happens. Anyone else? I'm a bit different as well because I'm, 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 I went to law school without doing an undergrad and came here, whereas um, Harp and I think um, um, someone else, came, Mitchell came back, right, from being in Canada before. So maybe you get questions about, I've heard that some people get questions about why they didn't go to Canadian law school, whereas I don't have to tackle, I don't have to tackle that one because I don't even have an undergrad. Yeah, I can see there being quite a difference between Charlotte and Ahmed, between the experience maybe you get and some of the questions you get asked compared to maybe some of the questions that Mitchell and Harp and you guys get asked, because there may be a difference, I don't know. Um, I also am from the UK and did an undergrad and then went to law school in the UK. So I only get asked it as an immigrant in yeah. Canada. But um, I don't know whether maybe it's a different thing. Mitchell, if you have any thoughts on that. Okay. Well, that, that's usually the first question that people want to know um, when, you, when you're meeting with them for a coffee or where, some, where you're in an interview. I've had a couple of interviews with some of the larger corporate firms, and I definitely echo what Charlotte said. You, you do kind of get the sense that you may be lucky if you're the one person who is from a foreign background that would be accepted there. And ultimately, they want to know, why did you go there? Um, and so this kind of bleeds into the, the question I was asked to answer a little bit, but I thought that maybe there was like a, a super scripted answer and like a perfect answer that somebody could use to say, oh, well, this is why I wanted to go because I was trying to expand my interests and this or that or literally anything other than saying that I didn't get accepted into Canadian law school because it, it felt like that would be something shameful to say. But what I realize now, having gone through the process and, and what I wish that I would have done is to just admit that I wasn't accepted and turn that into a strength to suggest that, you know, even though um, that particular route didn't work for me, that you could be a great candidate and you can show how dedicated you are to what you want to do and exhibit really great skills like perseverance and dedication and and all sorts of open-mindedness so that you can still achieve greatness really and so my suggestion would be that you don't need to shy away from your weaknesses but you should certainly find a way to to turn them into your strengths and one way that you can do that as a foreign lawyer or, or an internationally trained lawyer or anything like that it is by using all of that great life experience and highlighting those examples. But um, my suggestion would be that you're just honest about it and don't feel like you have to be embarrassed about anything because in, in many ways, we have to work a lot harder as internationally trained lawyers to actually get to the same places that some of the Canadian students get to more naturally because as it was alluded to earlier, we usually miss out on the summer articling positions and it's uh, a bit more difficult for us to become intertwined in the system once we start two, three years later than a lot of the people as master students. So there's a lot of really great skill and a lot of really hard work that goes into that. And I'm sure that um, that future employers would like to hear about that as opposed to what you might think they want to hear as a as a perfect answer and that makes you a lot more relatable as well yeah you basically did just answer your own question um for me before i even got to ask it so for anyone who didn't um get that the question that we were going to ask mitchell is what are the secrets to selling yourself to potential employers and i think mitchell's just done a really good answer but mitchell did you have anything else to add to that as well when you were thinking about that question 
Well, it's funny because when I was thinking about that, I, I was thinking about that same question that, that always kept coming up. Okay, so why didn't you go to, to Canadian law school? Um, but I think in order to sell yourself, you also have to know your audience. And so I would certainly recommend um, researching who's going to be doing the interview and see if you could connect with them, not only on a, a professional level, but on a personal level as well. Usually they'll include a little bio on their firm website or something like that. So you can go and you can look into that. And it, it seems like it's very rudimental advice, but it's actually uh, true that each firm is, is really looking for a specific type of person or, or a fit. And so if you can try to act as somewhat of a chameleon and, and anticipate what kind of people you might be being interviewed by, then you can potentially sell yourself by offering something other than just a, a robotic uh, law student who's going to come in and put their head down and, and do work from nine to five or nine to eight or whenever it might be for the corporate lawyers. But uh, I think that more and more now, well, before COVID anyways, people want to know that, you know, you, you are a person with individual interests and, and something to contribute, whether it's going to be helping to organize the annual ski trip or do the be the leader of the the chess week or whatever it might be that you're interested in you know just be individual and and try to put your best foot forward and be confident and i had gone through a couple interviews and didn't actually wind up landing up with a, a large firm and now that i did my articles with a smaller criminal law firm and would have been exposed to the criminal bar here in Vancouver and all of the types of people that you meet there. It, it seems crystal clear to me in hindsight that that wasn't going to be a good fit for me ever. And so I, I, I'm not surprised now that I didn't get those types of jobs. However, at the time it was certainly soul crushing and, and not a fun experience, but uh, you have to always just keep trying to stay confident and keep believing in yourself and and really be honest with your strengths and try to sell those and not try to sell what people are expecting you to say. Just to add to that, and also skipping back a little bit, sorry, Shashan, no, no. Um, is whereas some people, is put, if you've probably, if you've done your undergrad in Canada, you might be more likely to be asked, why did you leave? I find that I and maybe people that have come from other countries originally uh, have sort of the undertone of why will you stay? Like I'm often asked why I'm here, um, what, what are my intentions, um, why, why don't I want to practice in London? Um, so I, and, and in the same vein as what Mitchell just said um it's just important to be authentic when i try to be when i try to think of good answers to those questions there was something other than it's just so cool to have a city in the middle of the mountain and the ocean I mean, <laughs> that, I, that when it that was my real reason although i made it sound better than that um it didn't it didn't it didn't sound authentic at all at all um so then i i i got into the routine of hopefully having a window in my interview room and just saying something along the lines of like, well, look at it. <laughs> and then going with the going from there, it's just beautiful. And I like skiing and I like um, kayaking and I tell them about all those things that I've done um, that show that they're really genuine interests. Don't try and make something up. You will get caught out. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to embarrass myself, but actually I can't actually remember some of the things I made up and they didn't work. Um, same with practice areas. I went to some interviews when I was at law school in England and they'd asked me, they'd asked me what practice areas I was interested in. And I'd have looked at their website and seen, and seen what practice areas they were leading in, what practice areas they were good at. But what I didn't think about was if they're so good at it, I'm going to be talking to some of the best people in those areas and they're going to suss out really quickly that I know nothing about it. So it's way better to talk about something you're interested in and maybe know a little bit about, even if it's not the same interests as the people interviewing you. Um, you'll sound more knowledgeable, more passionate like that, I think. But yes, it's important to sort of see what they, what they do as well and know about them, but that's just the flip side of it, I think. 
I think um, if you don't mind that I jump in, I think I've got a story to share as well. I um, I went through the the big recruit and um, I was also um, stumped with the question of like, okay, so like, why didn't you go to law school here? And then, you know, I explained the entire story, whatever it was. And um, I remember not um, having my resume um, picked to go to like the next round. And I reached out to the recruiter and I was like, hey, so um, just wondering like, you know, can I get some like feedback or whatever? Um, and uh, they had pretty much just said that, oh yeah, like you're an ITL, um, this and that. And I was like, okay, I just have a question for you. Can you tell me um, if there's something that the JD students can do that I can't? And um, I'm sorry. Uh, um, so sorry about that. And uh, yeah, the, so the question was, is, is there something that the JD students can do that I can't? And I remember the recruiter was just like, you know, like she almost fell out of her chair because she didn't know how to answer that question. So I'm not saying that every one of you guys should go and, you know, um, use this, but I think again, like it's just trying to, to sell yourself and they're not weaknesses. Um, if anything, they're, they're strengths. You just need to change the narrative around that. So, um, I, I, I don't know. That's, that's my two cents regarding, uh, those those tough questions yeah and that's a perfect segue into my next question before we open it up to general questions um, from the panel so if you do have a, a question um, from the audience please do drop it in the chat box and then we'll call on you to ask your question directly to either the whole panel or to a specific panelist um, but I will ask this question whilst you all get typing um, what was the most important thing that you did or that you remember doing when looking for articling? And how did you all find your articling position in the end? So two questions, quite different questions, um, but I'm sure you've all got different stories. So who would like to go first? Armin, do you wanna go first? I finished school, I graduated in, in May, um... 2019 and then I took like a month off I traveled around and then I came back and I started actively looking for jobs it was it was challenging like I'm not gonna lie it was pretty easy I got like several interviews but then like sometimes people would just like ghost me like you know like not like they won't reply to my emails after sometimes it would say like oh we went with another candidate like sometimes it would say like it's just we don't have a job for you but would like to like go for coffee, like would like go for coffee or chat about like mm -hmm. what you want to do and stuff. So it's just like, I, I, I would say, uh, be like really organized. So and have like goals in mind. I was very interested in securities law at the beginning, but then I changed my mind after some, some time because it's, 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 maybe it's not the right area for me. I talked to people that they were practicing in this area and like I got their insights. So it's just like, honestly, like don't, don't have a mindset that this is the area I wanna go into because like it doesn't, it doesn't work like this. And like they are all like at the end, there's like a connection between several areas of, uh, of laws in Canada. So like if you are interested, for example, in like corporate law and like you wanna practice in this area, but then there are no opportunities right now. Like it's COVID, it's a pandemic and like it, it's very tough to find jobs. So it's just like, don't, don't have this, this mindset for me. Uh, I would say what, what worked really well, just like emailing and calling people. So I would like email, uh, like I had a list of people that I wanted to email. So I had like a, like a preliminary list. Like I wanted to talk to these people like these, I was interested in, in, in these firms. Um, so like I emailed those people, I would follow up. I would like call them. I was like, find something that they are interested in. Like at a genuine message is like, I, I read, I read this article and like, I think this point is like very valid. I can hear my comments just like to tell, to like show them that I'm interested in, 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 in what they do. I'm interested in, in their work rather than like looking for a job. And then you would introduce me to other people. So like, I think that works for me is just like asking people like, oh, do you know anyone uh, who's hiring like, uh, it's, it's, it's just like, it's a lot of work. So I would, I would wake up, I have like eight, eight hours of like, just like emailing and calling people. So like, it's a full-time job. It was a full-time job. Looking for a job was a full-time job for me. And I think it worked at the end. So I got my offer in, in October. So it didn't take me that long to find a job. It took around like um, maybe three or four, four months to start. But it, it, along the way, I met like several people that helped me and like gave me a, like very meaningful advice. Like some people that logged over my resume and cover letter. Some people, I'm still in touch with those people because like eventually like things change in the future, you know, like maybe like I was staying with my own friend, maybe I will change my area and like 
in, in, in like in a year or two. So like, it's just like things change. So I would say like, stay in touch and like be genuine when you talk to people, just like be super, be interested in what you do. Fantastic. Uh, Charlotte, what was your journey to find your arts course at Haskins? Did you go through the OCI process? No, and I didn't even know about it. Um, I, I didn't know about GLC. Uh, I didn't know much. I, I knew that the LLM was um, a good way to get my NCOs done. So I was a bit oblivious at that stage. Um, and then just the later, because I started the LLM in the September, and I started thinking about articling like in, in the spring. So by that stage, I was thinking about applying in the summer round of articling after the LLM. Um, but what I did, which would be, would be one of my two biggest tips, um, was um, to have a list of firms that I was interested in um, on somewhere, on either on a computer or just a note somewhere. And, can, and consistently check the websites to see if they have any last minute asking positions. Because, I, because sometimes they're not posted anywhere, they're just, they just fall through the gaps. Um, and that's what happened with my own position at Vaskin, even though it's such a big firm. Uh, it's surprising, it wasn't on the UBC careers page, it wasn't anywhere. Um, they, they, someone got a last minute position somewhere else, I think, and postponed their articling position by a year. So, I, I'd applied in the summer um, round of um, articling applications and I had interviews coming up the week after in like, some other big firms in Vancouver. Um, and then I saw on the Faskin website, because I'd had this habit of going through like every two weeks checking my list, that they were hiring for an articling student to start in three weeks time, which was crazy. So I applied and I don't think there would be many people that were available to start articling in three weeks time that didn't already have articling. So it shows that it's worth holding out for the right thing. So I'd, I'd, I'd been a paralegal for a year. And if I didn't have a position, I would have kept, kept being a paralegal. And it was such good experience. So like, if I wasn't going to do the LLM, I would say try and be a, do, be a paralegal, a legal assistant. I was a legal assistant first and then a paralegal. Um, and leading on to my thing that I think was most instrumental in getting me an article position, it was asking people that I'd worked with, mainly an associate I worked with as a paralegal to write me a letter of reference. And even though, even though they didn't ask for it, including it with my articling applications, um, they, so, someone that I'd worked closely with and I'd talked a lot with about my struggles as an ITL, my, um, my interests and my um, aspirations, wrote me the nicest re letter of reference um, about the work I'd done with him, about my capabilities, and I included that. And I think that, I, I, actually, I know that that is what got me the job at Baskin. Um, the the um, professional development person told me they were really impressed with my letter of reference, and that's definitely something that they don't necessarily ask for and people don't do so much. Good tip. Uh, Mitchell, because you applied for the big firms too, you mentioned that earlier. Did you go through the OCI process or? I, I did not. It was, it was my understanding that because we were only there for the short period of time for the one year that uh, it wasn't really as available. Um, so I didn't do that. My approach was um, similar to Ahmed's. We uh, well, I was just trying to look at all the different firms and what I would do is find somebody within an area of law that was interesting to me and I would email them and I would see if they wanted to go out for coffee or if I could come to the firm and chat with them a little bit. Uh, and I found that everyone was overwhelmingly really happy to do that. So I would send a little email with a few words about myself and why I'm interested. And then what I had done was when in, in my cover letters, I, I would use that as a, a little bit of a, a stepping stone to say, I'm really quite interested in your firm because I had such a positive experience speaking with so-and-so. And my hope was that that person would then be asked by the recruiters, oh, hey, what did you think of Mitchell when you went out for coffee with him? Now, whether or not that actually happened, I don't know. But in my mind, that's the way it played out. And I think um, that that was useful. And 
additionally to that, I was working with career services and taking every opportunity I could to book an appointment in with them to have them check my resume over and my cover letter over and, and then double check it after I made some changes. And so everybody there was really, really helpful. And that uh, wound up leading to me getting a couple, I think it was four interviews with some of the larger firms. And that was really useful because once I got into that position, I already kind of felt like I had some opportunity in these coffee meetups to polish my my interviewing skills and to think about what kind of things I might want to ask and, and what kind of things uh, I'm interested in and how that might become relatable in an interview setting. So um, between the career services and just trying to be proactive and reaching out to people in interesting positions and in interesting firms, that was generally my strategy. Uh, to answer your second follow-up question as to how I actually wound up uh, getting my job, it's, it's kind of funny because it was a friend of mine from the United Kingdom that was working as a paralegal at the criminal law firm that I articled with. And uh, she said, hey, I heard that they're looking for a full-time article student. And so she kind of helped me to get in touch with somebody. And I think she put in a good word. And then once I had my foot in the door, I, I kind of did the rest from there. So uh, it's just a great example of, of never knowing where an opportunity might come from. And, and I think that those opportunities also are easier to come by when you're actively looking for them, as, as Charlotte had said. And so even though all of those coffee meetups in a way didn't really lead to um, an articling position, you know, indirectly, I like to think that they did because it, it just got me more accustomed to being brave and reaching out to people and, and being more comfortable with speaking about myself and my interests. So uh, you should always be nice to everybody if, if you didn't already know that. <laughs> like that being brave and practicing right using all those coffee dates to practice your pitch as such uh, and you know refining it so that then when you do find the perfect position with the perfect company you've got it down you're not worried about what you're saying because you've, you've practiced it harp what about you how did you find your articling position Okay, so uh, I ended up finishing my master's, I think it was in August, and I ended up signing um, my contract in May of 2020 this year, but I started, I think it was end of April or May, right when the pandemic had literally um, uh, taken off. Um, my, I had gotten the position off of a posting from um, UBC's career website, but I want to maybe share all the things that I did. Um, the Canadian Bar Association, if you're a student, I think the membership is like 20 bucks or 30 bucks or something. I highly recommend that because they have a classified section and they do post um, articling um, postings there. The Trial Lawyers Association of BC as well, I have seen multiple postings and those postings don't necessarily make it on Craigslist or Kijiji or um, I don't even know what other search engines and stuff there are. Um, I also was reaching out to um, headhunters, so legal um, recruiters. I think one of them was called Impact Recruitment and the other one is like Eva Lee Associates. And so basically I had um, was seeing if any one of the firms would, um, instead of taking on a paralegal or legal assistant, would be willing to take on an articling student. And so I actually did have quite a bit of uh, Quite a few interviews set up but um sometimes the issue ended up being that um the principal had to have been practicing for five years um to take on a student so i think those are also like really really good ways to find um unposted job postings um cold calling is so um important um you can do that by introducing yourself to someone asking them for like you know 10 to 15 minutes, 20 minutes for a quick phone call or coffee. I don't know if people are meaning for coffee now, obviously, or, or something virtual. Um, but with that, try and be respectful of people's time. I know that um, everyone's super busy with their billable hours and stuff. But if you've got a couple of questions that you want to ask about that certain field of practice, I think it's a um, really good way to, again, like how everyone just mentioned, um, to kind of practice your skills and kind of get into that interviewing, um, I don't know, environment I don't for lack of a better word um, trying to think what else um, yeah just uh, sometimes even just picking up like the phone book um, I remember I did that I was also on is it Canadian lawyers directory or something I don't know someone might want to correct me there's something along the lines of that that's on there I mean literally just pulling up all the names of the people or even going on the BC Law Society and just you know 
doing a search of like all the people who are in under the letter A and just like, you know, calling and seeing if, um, you know, that's a certain practice area that you want to do, but it's just so important to get yourself out there because, um, I think now with the pandemic and everything going on, it is going to be a little bit more challenging, but the onus is kind of on um, everyone who's looking for an art clean position to, you know, put in the hours. And one thing that I really liked about what Ahmed said was when I was searching for art clean, I treated it like a full-time job. I was literally doing eight hours a day. Um, I had a spreadsheet. I would write down who I talked to, who the recruiter was or whatever, and I would write down notes. And then I would kind of have a system. If the person asked me to follow up in two weeks, I would also follow up. Um, so I think, yeah, just, just being organized. Um, someone had mentioned something about OCIs. So OCI stands for um, on-campus interviews, and those are particularly normally for first and second year students. So as an LLM, you didn't necessarily get to participate in that, but I think it's June and in August, it's VI Portal that does a big recruit for um, article clean students. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but um, I think that's for everyone who's like either an ITL or going through the process of their NCAs. I think um, the VI portal is probably what you're going to want to look into and not the OCIs. And unfortunately, I don't think that the OCIs are for any um, outside, uh, I guess, people who aren't in a studying at a Canadian law school don't get to participate in the OCI process. But with that being said, is if you see um, uh, a law firm posting and asking for, or, or going through the OCI process, why not reach out to the recruiter and be like, hey, like, can I participate? So again, just trying to find ways to, you know, get in there and, and get your name in and exposure. I think those are really important um, ways to kind of find art of clean positions that aren't necessarily posted. LinkedIn is really good as well too. So yeah, just um, increase your exposure in whatever way possible. Yeah, it's a good point, um, Hop. So OCIs, there is an OCI um, round now for internationally trained lawyers, so for NCA candidates in Ontario. So it is specifically for Ontario. There are national law firms who are taking part in that, which there is no harm in applying for the OCI process in Ontario for a national firm and saying, hey, but you know what, I'm interested in working in one of your other offices. You never know what might happen. This is like, I think, the second year of OCIs in Ontario. So um, it is something GLC, we would like to add to our list of things to see if we can do something similar out here as well in BC and also in Alberta as well. Um, so it's on our long list of things we'd like to do for ITLs across the board. Um, but I don't think we're going to make it happen this year, unfortunately, for you guys. Um, but that's something you may see us posting about, and it is predominantly for Ontario this year. Um, can I just chip in something? I know, I know for a fact that some big firms flew over during the OCI period to Ontario to interview people that had applied over there. So that I'd never thought of that, but that's such a good call. Yeah, so I mean, it's worth it. You never know, right? Um, at this point, um, you know, I know there's a question on here about specifically about applying during the pandemic, what we're in right now. Um, and I can feel the concern. I know I get an awful lot of messages like the rest of our panelists. Um, from Pete, from students who are asking like what are we doing that like the number of article clean positions has been massively reduced this year um so you know the competition has increased from last year for example um, because of the pandemic and that's because there has been a hiring freeze across the majority of the legal profession for 2020 um, and that's at all levels and across all different practice areas. And that is starting to change. Um, we are starting to see it from our own BC chapter board. We are seeing our own board members finding new jobs during the pandemic and recently, um, both at the articling stage and also at the associate stage as well. So there are positions coming up. Um, just keep going, keep going. Like the, the panelists have given you some great tips and um, keep trying them out. Okay, we're going to call on some people. Priya, hopefully that answered your question. Tamvir, hopefully that answered your question. But if not, please comment and let me know that it, if it didn't. Um, Elena, hopefully I pronounced your name right. Do you want to ask your question? Hi, everyone. Um, so I was just wondering, everyone says that it's much more difficult for internationally trained lawyers to find an article in and it, it's been said a few times tonight too, and I've been hearing it a lot, but I'm wondering what happens after you complete your article in? Is it also 
much more difficult to find to land a job than for locally trained lawyers or everything is kind of leveled leveled out after you complete your article in like are, are we in the same situation after we finish it and we are fighting and struggling and keep doing it i can take a shot at this one if you want um so as a proviso, this is just my experience and just my opinion, and, but but a educated opinion from talking to a few different people, I would hope. So I think that at large firms, ITLs are still slightly less likely to get hired back, unfortunately. When I look at my firm that I articled with and I look at the ITLs, normally one per year, as I said, that they hired, they have a worse hire back rate. But I didn't, I, I, I don't, I think it gets incrementally easier um, past articling. I really think articling is the, is the hardest stage for ITLs. I think once you have that experience behind you and people that will speak for you, um, um, that can give you references, just like everyone else, it gets much easier. I don't think I struggled too much more than my um, other um, fellow articling students to find a, post cool job. I think I was roughly on the set, on a level playing field. Um, and just like I said for asking positions in the first place, again, because it worked so well for me, I asked par a partner at Baskin to write me a letter of reference. And I and that's basically what got me my next job. So it's worked consistently well for me to, for someone to not have to give that person a call, but have the letter right there. Um, and don't be scared when you're articling to try and work directly with really senior people because they're the people that have influence and they're the names that you're going to put on your application that you worked with for your next job. And um, they're gonna, and the person's going to recognize the name and think, okay, yeah, that's some sort of stamp mark of quality and good, good training. So people do shy away from working with partners rather than associates if you're in a larger firm definitely try and work with partners and that, and then and then you should be good for going forward you should be on a similar playing field i would i would say from my experience what about everyone else oh, oh go ahead go on, one of you ahmed you go first okay so i would say for small and mid-sized firms like when they hire an articling student i believe that they hire them with the intention of keeping them after because like you spend the time and money winning this student I, I, my boss asked me like maybe three months in my like my articles is like what do you want to do after like do you want to stay do you like this area of practice like what do you think like it's just like because like these spend the time and money training you so like why wouldn't they hire you like it's just like don't worry do like your best to like do a really good job but what you do and like do the work and like learn so like i think like the outcome would, would be good and as charlotte said like it's easier i would say like after 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 articles so like once you finish your articles like there are more opportunities after after that, something else like Mitchell talked about about fit. I want to share like a, a funny story. So like I, I emailed this uh, sole practitioner that like I'm looking for a job, and then like they replied right after. It's like oh come tomorrow like for an interview. So I went for an interview. It was very like very quick. I would say like maybe 30 minutes, and then they emailed me after. It's like oh we'd like to offer you an article in position. Something was like really off about this. I was like what? Like that was really quick. So like I went to the Law Society's website and I checked this person and I found there were like two bending disciplinary actions against them. So it's like, it's not always like, it's not always the best idea to take the first thing that comes your way because like sometimes you never know. And like, you don't want to be in a position working with someone with like major disciplinary actions against them because like you never know what will happen in, in, in the future. So watch out for these things and always check the directory on the Law Society's website. Good points. Uh, Mitchell? Well, I was just going to echo what, what Ahmed said. You know, in our particular firm, uh, we are trying to expand. We've, we've got office space. It's these two experienced lawyers who started the firm going on three years ago. So whenever we hire somebody as an article student, um, there is always a, a hope, I think, from their point of view, that as long as you're doing good work and that you're fitting in, well that there's going to be an opportunity to for you to take up some space so i think it depends on on what type of firm but but for us in particular 
uh, there's always seeming to be a lot of room, even at, at the place where I articled. Uh, if it meant that I was just going to take a, a small IKEA desk and put it up against the wall, you know, they were they were willing to let me buy in and and use the 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 resources of the firm and everything as well. So. I think that Ahmed is, is certainly right that w when you get into a smaller type of setting, there is a lot more time and, and energy and resources that go into it. And it does almost, we've had somebody who decided that they wanted to go out on their own. And, you know, I think that the partners were uh, almost a little hurt by it because it, it does feel somewhat personal. Like they've spent so much time trying to, trying to get you ready, but you have to do what's good for you in the end of the day. And I think Elena, I'd add as well that um, not necessarily about ITLs, but if you article with a sole practitioner or a smaller firm, irrespective of where you've gone to law school or your previous law school experience, if you're then trying to make the move from a sole practitioner up to a national or international law firm, that may be a big jump, depending on the experience you gained during your articles or even as a one year call associate. So it may be that you need to do stepping stones. If your ultimate goal is to get into a national or an international firm, you maybe need to go from a sole practitioner to a mid-sized firm. And then a few years later, make the move across laterally. Mm -hmm. So I think irrespective of whether you're an ITL, that goes for anybody. So it's, I've very rarely seen somebody go from a sole practitioner articling to then working at a national law firm. Has happened because there's always exceptions, um, but just expect to make those steps rather than a straight jump. Yeah, so just to add something, I just, it's, almost, it's not really gonna add, it's more maybe an unnecessary summary, but just a simplification. I think if you, if you go to a big firm, you're, more like, you're less likely to be kept at the firm, but you, you've basically got any size of firm that you could foreseeably go and apply to. Whereas if you go to a smaller firm, um, you're more likely to be hired, but it might be more difficult to get into a big firm. Is that what you agree? Yeah, I would think so. I'm conscious of time and there's lots and lots of questions. We're going to speed through some of the questions on here. Um, Pop, one directly for you from Sarah. And Sarah, sorry, she can't ask this herself, but her microphone's not working today. So how often did you inverse the narrative? So this was when you were talking about getting feedback from the recruitment HR team at the firm after they rejected you and you switched it around and said, well, what's the difference between me and a JD student? Um, how often did you do that? And then did they actually change their mind and call you back for the next round of interviews? Yeah, so uh, that narrative, I think I had only inverse that. I think that was just the one time, but um, it, I think it was, I, I was also very cautious because the response that I got back from the recruiter was just like, oh shit, like you got me. I don't know what to say. Um, but uh, I, I think it, I think it was really good because I, you know, it kind of got them thinking and um, it, I, I think definitely you can use it, but just uh, maybe think about it a little bit. Um, and in terms of getting around to the next round after, um, yeah, I did. Uh, that firm ended up hiring um, six students and unfortunately I was the seventh. So I didn't make the cut. I had a really long conversation after with the recruiter and she had basically said that, you know, like all the other partners were sheepish because I was an internationally trained lawyer, but like I had all this experience I was working in like the legal profession as like a legal system since I was like 16. So I was kind of, you know, shocked and like heartbroken. But I mean, like, again, like, I think this just goes back to the point that Mitchell was saying that like, that place probably wouldn't have worked out for me. And so whatever is meant to be for all you guys will happen. Just um, don't be so again, like harsh on yourselves. And um, they're not weaknesses. They're all strengths. So always keep that in mind. Um, and personally, I think of all the um, people who have studied abroad, I feel like we're very resilient and there isn't one thing that, you know, a person who's gone to the Canadian law um, school can do better than um, someone who's studied abroad. So again, just definitely use it as your strength. If I could just chime in quickly, I, I won't tell the whole story, but I think that you also need to be able to stand up for yourself when, when it does feel sometimes like they're almost like picking on you a little because you are doing something different. 
in my interview with the the law firm that I got my articles with, it was kind of funny because it actually felt like it was the worst interview of all of the ones that I had done. And it got to a point where he asked that question and, and I kind of just said something along the lines of like, look, it wasn't a punishment to go to do what I want to do. And, and I think that at that point, because of the type of law that I was uh, applying for and interviewing for and, and with criminal law, you have to be able to stand up for other people. And, and if you can't even stand up for your rights or, or for your own kind of self, then it's going to be difficult to do that. So I, I think that the, the, and the partner of that firm appreciated that type of answer. Yeah, very true. You like practice advocacy that you will be using for your clients, but you're advocating for yourself here. Um, and you guys are really good. Like you've all got some great talent, some great experience, some fantastic stories. And it's just a matter of like showcasing that to the potential employers and demonstrating how that can be beneficial to them and their clients. Um, so think about that. Think about what skills you can bring to them that they might need on that one. Um, there was a good question here. Nirali, do you want to ask your question? And I apologize if I screwed up your name. Hi. Uh, no, no, the pronunciation was just fine. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to ask that I still have a year. So I'm still studying. I'm, I'm from India. So I'm still studying. And I can't give my NCA exams before the next October. So I was wondering if I can apply to all these summer positions uh, that are open right now and if that would actually help me in getting an articling position later on. Good question. Who wants to tackle that one? I, I think from, from our point of view as a smaller firm, it, it certainly would. Uh, whenever we have our, our summer students, we naturally have already decided on who's going to do the full term of articling from, from when that person's finished. But right away, we're thinking, okay, is this person somebody that we want to then invite back and, uh, and offer a full article position to? So I think if you can do it, it would certainly be advantageous to you. And in fact, it's one of the challenges as an internationally trained lawyer that it can be hard to get into that position because of the timing of doing a master's degree and then wanting to just jump right into articles. But if you have the time and if you have the ability to do it, I would certainly recommend it. Okay, thank you. I just have, okay, sorry. I, I just want to add a question to that. Uh, there is a lot of gap, I believe, between the summer position and the time when they hire articling recruits. So if you could also give me suggestions on uh, if, because I have been asked this question once that what do you intend to do with that time? And honestly, I don't know what I could do. So if you could also help me with my options in that time. Sure, I think it depends on what type of law. I mean, you've heard some of our, our speakers have said how they've done like paralegal work or, or maybe there's some research that you can do in a related field or, or, or something that's relatable. So for most of the people that are coming out of the master's program, the, the trouble is, is that they don't necessarily in a perfect world want to have to wait a whole year before they wind up getting articles. But uh, if it means that it's a, a way for you to to get your foot in the door and get some real experience to add to your CV and then hopefully make an impression and get hired on. Um, I, I think that, that that's a, a great opportunity and I'll, I'll let someone else maybe speak about what to do with that time because I didn't have that for when I got started. I had a lot of time um, before I found an asking position and I've said already, but I'm such a huge advocate of being a legal assistant or power legaling. It was actually, my most enjoyable stage, I think, to date. I loved it. Um, I didn't have the pressure of articling or PLTC and I was getting hands-on experience and it was, it, was, it was sort of experience that I've talk, I talk about to this day. Um, and I used one of those um, recruitment, um, like, te like temp firms as well. I used uh, Arlen Recruiting to find my paralegal job. That's A-R-L-Y-N. And they were really helpful. And I got a short term legal assistant position, which then became a full time power legal position for a year. So that's one option. Uh, then uh, you, some people, if you're lucky, could, could get like a research assistant job through the LLM. I know some people that stayed on a little bit and did some research for one of their professors. That might be an easier thing to do if you've done some 
courses at the in the LLM that weren't the NCA courses, like some of the seminar units that I said that I wanted to do instead of doing some of the NCAs. I know people that got stuff like that. And then there's some like non articling non lawyer jobs in um, legal organizations. Like if you're interested in the um, um, not profit sector, like some of the really great organizations in Vancouver, like West Coast Leaf, like West Coast Environmental Law, if that's what you're interested in, or like Atira Women's Society, have jobs that come up all the all the time that are like communications roles or uh, outreach or uh, even an ad advocate roles. There there are some of those around that are that don't require you to be a lawyer, but just require but just allow you to give inf legal information to people calling in. Um, I see those coming up now, and I'm, I, I and I'm, I always think they would be so great for someone in that in that stage. Um, yeah. Yeah. You could do contract management, you could do claims adjusters, um, if you're wanting to go into banking or corporate, um, so finance or corporate, you could get a job working with one of the financial institutions, or you could work with one of the brokers, um, or you could work with one of the securities exchanges, basically anything you can do that is relevant to the type of work you want to do in the end and you can show how you've gained commercial awareness or hands-on experience of working in a legal team or a legal practice area that's all you really need to do on that whatever you do stay in canada and do something like just having canadian experience whatever it is like siobhan said will get you a long way just don't go out don't do something out of canada because even my good experiences in England are less valuable, I think, to employers than um, other experiences in Canada that they can relate to. Yeah, I think Ahmed's not it. Ahmed, are you still volunteering or did you stop volunteering now that you're articling? Where? Were you volunteering earlier on with one of the um, societies? Yes, I was, I was, uh... I was in the GLSS uh, as well. I was like uh, the career service officer. So I was helping like organizing some events like this. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so you can do things like that too, right? To gain um, experience as well at the same time. Um, okay, there are a couple of questions left and we are gonna rapidly run out of time. Um, so I'm gonna go with Tanvir, do you want to ask your question? Hi everyone, thanks for, for hosting the session today. Um, my question is actually, I was in a different career before, before going to law school and one of the reasons I ended up going overseas uh, to Australia was because, well, my timing was, was such. I've got a background in public health, but I was wondering, did any of you switch careers or have a previous career before going to law school? And how have you had, um, how has that helped you? Because what I'm finding right now is that my previous experience, it's, it's valuable, but it's not legal experience. So the legal experience, I'm not getting as much, even though I have almost two years worth of legal experience, but almost five years worth of um, public health experience. So any suggestions on how to get around that and uh, no, because I'm still looking for an articling position. Just my 10 cents, I don't think there's anything to get around. I think that will only be really positive to you. I don't think it's something you need to explain away, explain it. Like, I think that I think it will be, there's so many transferable skills in whatever you've done. And especially if, if it's an area of law that translates from, the, from that previous career, even if I found that if you go to a firm that does something medical related, even if it's not the area of law you want to do, you can say, oh, like I've got this experience too. It might get your foot in the door. I know that when in, in areas like construction, if someone's got an engineering background, they often go to a firm that does some construction and say like, oh, I've got this background. So, I'm in, so I would like to see what that's like on the legal side. And they do something totally different, but then they know they were going to do something totally different. But it's a good way to get their foot in the door. I don't know whether that's something you could do with your 
medical experience um maybe like someone that someone that does like medical negligence or something something like that um i know people have done that i don't have the personal experience though so if someone does they'd probably be better place to speak to. you might you might want to look into harper gray as a firm i think they're the the primary providers of medical negligence here in, in downtown vancouver um so they, I'm sure would love to have some of that policy or maybe anything with the government perhaps that is like writing policy or, or using that type of work. But there's certainly a lot of transferable skills there as, as Charlotte said. I, before law school, was working at a butcher shop. So I'm not 100% sure that you necessarily need to have a, like a breadth of, of knowledge and a breadth of experience. But in my view, that's why I thought that it was so important to, to get involved in extracurricular activities. So I knew that I didn't really have a whole lot of experience because I never interned or, or had a part-time job or anything like that at a law firm. So um, anything that you can do while you're still in school or, or anything that you can try to find for yourself, as we've been talking about, to put something on your resume is, is certainly better than, than nothing. But it sounds like you already have a lot of great skills there. Mm. You, you have got more than I did when I got started, so put it that way. Me too. Well, thank, thanks very much. It's just a tough um, tough starting for an articling position when everything's uh, changed so much. But thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, Tanvir, don't, I would look at everything you did. So I had a career beforehand. Um, I worked in local government. And what I did when, when I was applying for training contracts in the UK and then articling here in Canada was I pulled apart the, the job that I did. So I looked at all the tasks that I did during that career and figured out how those tasks I did were relatable to what you would need to do in a law firm or in a law practice, whether that's in-house or in private practice. And that's what we talk about when we talk about transferable skills. It's what have you done previously that's the same? So have you got time management, conflict resolution? Um, can you, are you organized? Have you worked as part of a team? Have you drafted complex documents? Have you had to read complex documents and summarize them? So whether they're policies, internal or government policies, um, all of those kind of skills are transferable and relatable to any practice area as a lawyer later on. And personally, when I'm hiring, if I see somebody who's got five years of experience in industry, they're going to come for an interview because I want, because they know, they know how to work in a business. They understand about deadlines. They understand about conflicting timelines. Whereas, if my alternative is a candidate who's never had a job before, they may have never experienced any of those situations before. So it's a little bit easier for me in a hiring role. And maybe I'm different, maybe I'm not the same as everybody else, but I would jump up interviewing somebody with five years experience if they could then explain that five years experience and how it's gonna be helpful for them in their law career going forward. So hopefully maybe that helps and helps everybody else here think about transferring their skills and how they relate to a Canadian market. Because as all of our panelists have said tonight, all of your experience is not a negative, it's a positive. But the tricky part for all of you, and I think everybody on the panel has said this, it's on you to explain how it's relevant and how it makes you the best candidate for the position. And that can be challenging. So one of the things that I think Charlotte mentioned earlier on and also Mitchell and Ahmed were research the firms, research the people at the law firms, figure out what it is you want to do. Okay, there's a lot of law firms in BC. There's a lot of law firms in Canada. Don't waste your time applying to every single law firm and lawyer out there. Be targeted with your approach spend that little bit extra time doing your research and really think about how you can add value and what you're going to get out of that experience. And hopefully that'll help you make your applications more targeted and also get you better results. Yeah, and if I could just say one last thing, don't underestimate the skills, even if they don't seem to be law related either, because honestly, I 
probably use the skills that I learned in customer service when I was working at that butcher shop in my day-to-day -day life as a lawyer, talking to quote unquote, blue collar kind of average people that just need help more than a lot of other skills that I have honed uh, along my, my career path. So you never know when it's going to become relatable. Like I said, too, I remember one of my interviews at, at one of the corporate law firms, I, I had put that on my resume, of course, because it's there and I, I'm proud to have done it. And it wound up being a conversation starter. We started talking about barbecue and uh, like how much stuff we, we like to cook and how and everything. And, you know, you just you never know. So um, there's definitely legal stuff, but there's also just kind of like real world, like what kind of person are you? How do we think we're going to get along? And I think that whether or not people put that at the forefront of, of interviews and, and hiring, that that's, that's definitely something that, that is there too. So lots and lots to, to, to offer. Absolutely. So on that note, guys, thank you all for your questions. I'm going to hand over to Ryan to wrap up for this evening. He's going to give us our little spiel, but just before he does the little wrap up, I want to give a little plug for our next two virtual mentor office hour sessions. And these are a great way for you guys to network and a great way for you to connect because once you attend one of these sessions, you can then reach out to the panelists, you can reach out to other attendees using LinkedIn um, and you can broaden your network that way and you never know who you might meet. So on Monday, this one's at 9 a.m. Pacific, midday Eastern, we are doing a special session on privacy and technology law and we have two lawyers joining us from the Vancouver office of McCarthy Tetro. So that's 9 a.m. on Monday. And then on Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time, we are going to be joined by Angela Han and Charlotte Chamberlain is going to be moderating this session. And Angela is a healthcare lawyer in the US, but she also has a blog called Fit to Practice. And she's going to be talking all about how it's important that we as lawyers at all different stages of our career take care of our own bodies and mind so that we can actually then help our clients. Um, so that one's a really interesting one, slightly different, um, but hopefully it'll be really interesting. She's going to take lots and lots of questions. But Ryan, over to you. Hello, everybody. Good evening or good morning, whatever time zone you happen to be in. Uh, so as she said, my name is Ryan. I'm the current president of GLSS. Uh, we are the student organization. Um, for the LLM students at uh, the University of British Columbia. So I think each year it's a little bit different. Um, the big things we try to do is organize one career event for the common law students, uh, try to get law firms in to, to meet students and a, just a career affair uh, type event. And then we also do a research event uh, for the LLM students to present research, uh, try to bring academic, uh, in, academic works from outside the university into uh, into our building to give presentations and kind of offer more opportunities that way. Of course, everything is a little bit different with COVID. Um, everything's a little bit more difficult. So this year, what we're trying to focus on is you know building a cohort uh, among students. And so I think it's one of the advantages of the LLM is meeting and networking, um, taking classes, and and getting to know your fellow students really well. So we're breaking up our big sessions into smaller ones, uh, trying to hold uh, career events, you know, kind of one hour, two hour events uh, for students to meet other lawyers practicing in Canada, uh, practicing in Vancouver, and then also trying to give opportunities for individuals uh, to present their research and to bring people in. But um, primarily we, we advocate for students, um, try to present what students need to the, the faculty, uh, we serve on everything from the, um, you know, faculty council meetings, which in include all of the lectures and the professors in the university, you know, discussing big policy type issues to the equity committee, um, the advisory committee uh, on hiring positions. Um, so we really try to, to give a student voice uh, throughout the university. Uh, if any, anyone has any questions, um, if I can help connect anyone to you know, any faculty members or professors in the university, um, I, I would happily field any emails uh, or questions in that regard. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Ryan. And thank you so much, GLSS, for helping us put this event on tonight. Um, 
it's really good for us as an organization to connect with alumni and also with the current students at UBC and also prospective students who are considering doing an LLM at UBC, but also doing an LLM at other institutions across Canada as well. Um, to our panelists, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for giving up your time and sharing your stories. And I hope one day in the not too distant future, we will actually all get to meet in person and we can hear some of these interesting stories that we won't be recording and sharing on YouTube. But in the meantime, um, please do reach out to any of our panelists. They've all offered that you can connect on LinkedIn with them. I would suggest um, that if you're reaching out to people on LinkedIn and you've met them or seen them on a panel, um, just mention where you've, connect, where you've seen them before and explain that's why you're connecting with them. It's just a nice way for the presenters to know why you're connecting with them. And also it's the springboard to start a conversation. Um, which then makes networking a lot, lot easier um, and cold calling a lot simpler, at least from my experience in the past. Um, guys, thank you again so much. We'll hopefully see you all again. Charlotte, I'm looking forward to you on being the moderator on Thursday. So do come join us for Thursday and also on Monday. And we will see you all again very soon. And good luck with all of your exams, everybody. Thanks very much. Take care, everyone.